Welcome to the um, first Collier Prize in Ancient Numismatics. And we're delighted to have our colleague Richard Abdi from the British Museum here today in person, as well as Carol Ann Menzi Collier. Richard, um, who is the first person to receive this new prize, um, is a former colleague of mine from the British Museum. Um, he started his career originally in the Department of Greek and Roman Antiquities, where I actually encountered him many times. And then in 1998, joined the Department of Coins and Medals as a curator of Roman coins. And he belongs to this um, very small and most impressive group of individuals that I know that seems to be able to single-handedly work through seemingly endless coins of what appear to be late Roman coins um, that come through the Department of Coins and Medals. Um, and the term is they have to be processed as part of the um, Treasure Act, the 1996 Treasure Act. And it's always been a mystery to me um, how people do that. Um, when I was a curator there, I remember my um, then supervisor, Roger Bland, tried this unsuccessfully on me. And after I came for every coin and asked, what is this coin? I clearly was not subjected to the late Roman identification. But Richard is one of these extraordinary individuals in the book that we're looking at here uh, is, is output, this extraordinary output that he does on the side. But his work is very much on holds, but also exhibitions and other things. So. The price here that we um, are awarding today, you might wonder where does this come from? And Carol Ann said, maybe you can say a few words um, where this came from. When Carol Ann first came to the American Numismatic Society with this idea to create something, some, something in memory of her late husband, um, Professor James Collier, and she will talk about him a little bit. We had a number of ideas, but it became rapidly clear that the idea of creating a prize for research accomplished, written in either book or um, I should mention this um, as an online or database or whatever project. So it's not just a printed book. And because we, we live in a period where those of us um, and we, at the ANS, we've been successful in that same respect, but also in Europe, where enormous sums of money are given for all sorts of projects. And there is always this money comes with the promise to do something. But actually, what this price does is it's the uh, it's the finished product that which is often the more difficult thing um, as those of us involved in these things and i'm the first to say this um, can show and and something as impressive as um ric and and richards as well as i'd like to immediately recognize also the contribution um by um peter mittag who might be online and i say hi in case he is um is is really a remarkable achievement and um his book if you you might wonder how this works, there is a jury of five senior numismatists and um, in that case books were sent in quite a few of them, a short list was created and the people on the jury had to then read all these very sizable contributions and it was a very tough decision, it is actually a credit to the field of numismatics that there were um, quite a few good um, submissions and and um i'm very very pleased that this prize recognizes this and and my gratitude um to carol ann for actually creating this so i will now i believe turn over to um our executive director no you come okay to carol ann See, they tell me this 15 times, but I always we change it. I'm um, to Carol Ann, who is going to say a few words about um, her late husband, uh, Jim Collier. Carol. Thank you, Uta. 
Thank you, Richard, for being here and for being the first uh, winner of the Collier Prize. My uh, chance to t talk to you today is really to tell you about Jim Collier, because with the exception of the four people in the second row, no one here has ever met him. Jim Collier was born on Halloween in 1943 at, ah, Victor, of course, remind me. He was born on Halloween in 1943 in Bellingham, Washington at the Canadian border at the foot of Mount Baker. He graduated from Pacific Lutheran University in 1965 with a Bachelor of Arts in History. And then he went to Boeing to work as an engineer. He was seconded to Washington, D.C. on the Minuteman Project, where his office was located just across the street from the National Gallery. So for two years, every day, he went to the National Gallery to have lunch, and he realized that his real love was art and art history and not engineering. So he returned to the Northwest and in 1970 got a master's degree in history of art at the University of Oregon and received his PhD in art history at the University of Michigan. Jim took a position at Auburn University in the Department of Art, where he ultimately became tenured professor, as well as department chair. Over the course of his academic career, he lectured widely and published on the Italian Renaissance and early Netherlandish perspective. That had been the subject of his dissertation, which was called Linear Perspective in Flemish Painting and the Art of Petrus Christus and Dirk Bouts. His interest in perspective and its application in visual arts had deep roots. Even as a child, his kindergarten teacher recognized that he had an unusual awareness of perspective for a child of his age. His series of paintings, eccentric views of Italian architecture, reflect his lifelong interest in perspective. While a PhD student at the University of Michigan, he assessed Professor Marvin Eisenberg with the University of Michigan's Sarah Lawrence Summer Program in Italy. It was in the sacristy of the Florentine Church of Santa Croce that Jim and I met in 1972. In 1990, we moved to the Netherlands where he had originally been an AFS student, American Field Service exchange student in 1960. He continued to lecture on art history and to work as an academic as well as doing tours with the Smithsonian. He set up his studio in the 17th century canal house on the Kaisersgracht and never looked back. He was passionate about painting. Essentially self-taught, he studied at the National Academy of Design. His subjects varied from portraits to cityscapes to tall ships to fantasies. He was above all a serious realist. His work displays not only acute attention to detail and the play of light and shadow, but also the joy he took in the medium of painting and its long history. He combined his academic interest in perspective with painting by reconstru reconstructing the first painting in single point perspective, Filippo Brunelleschi's lost painting of the Florentine Baptistry. The painting was exhibited in the Italian exhibit Spazio in the Biennale in Venice in 1986, and is now in the permanent collection of the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo in Florence, where the original experiment was conducted in 1425. He was passionate about traveling. He visited over 80 countries in the course of his life. In 2012, he sailed with a crew of three on a 50-foot boat from Cape Town to South South Africa to Rio de Janeiro, covering 4,000 nautical miles. He was passionate about motor racing, open-wheeled Indy cars, Formula One, and unlimited hydroplanes. He made over 20 trips to the Indy 500 and, form and followed the Formula One circuit religiously. He was passionate about Rome and led numerous groups of students through the streets of the city, sharing with them his deep knowledge of the ancient world that he loved so much. He was an excellent teacher who brought the ancient world alive to those students. He was passionate about ancient coins. 
His interest in corn started when he was six years old. His father had returned from a business trip to New York and put six ancient coins under the Christmas tree for him. He collected for the next 65 years. The last coin, an aureus of Nero, was logged into the collection a week before he died in October 2015. His love for Rome and for the classical world has been commemorated by the Collier Scholarships at the American Academy in Rome. These annual scholarships allow students from Oregon, Michigan, and Alabama to attend the American Academy's Rome Classical Summer Stu Studies. His passion for the ancient world continues for future generations. So Jim Collier was a man of many interests. He was warm, witty, and passionate. He was a teacher, a scholar, a collector, a traveler, and a serious realist artist. But most of all, he was modest, and his close friends who are here today will attest to that. We know that he would be mortified to see this presentation today with his name so prominent. But it's fitting that his passion for the ancient world and his ardent love for history and the culture of Europe and ancient coins is commemorated with this prize. I'm grateful to the American Numismatic Society for sponsoring this first event and look forward to supporting the Collier Prize in ancient numismatics for many years to come. And now, Richard, if you would be so kind to come up here. <laughs> I have the pleasure of presenting to you the check <laughs> to the first winner. Thank you. And as a British citizen, you're very happy to receive U.S. dollars. I'm very happy to receive U.S. dollars. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, good evening. So, uh, my name is Gilles Bransbourg, the American Numismatic Society Executive Director. It's my pleasure to say a few words about uh, the book uh, we are honoring tonight. So, first of all, I'd like to say a word for the, all the authors who sent us extremely good uh, submission and books. Um, we had about 10 books, if I remember correctly. All of them were very good. It was an extremely tough choice. And we came to this determination, but at the same time, um, we want to thank everybody who was part of this uh, submission process and to praise the quality of everything we received. So, Richard Abdi published the volume two, part three of Roman Imperial Coinage. So, what is Roman Imperial Coinage? It's a very old series of books uh, published by Spink. And the last time a volume was published was in the mid 90s, uh, RIC number 10 uh, by Professor Kent. So basically each of these volumes cover part of the Roman Imperial history. And you're dealing with something like 40,000 type of coins over these almost five centuries or even more than five centuries from Octavian until the reign of Zeno in 491 uh, CE. So it's a very long durée uh, type of numismatic history. Um, I will use the words of Richard Abdi. Under Adrian, the emperor he's covering, in AD 117, the Roman Empire stood at its greatest, ex greatest extent. At the same time, it means that it's probably more difficult to work on a range that covers such a wide geographic uh, expanse compared to shorter reigns or other periods when the Roman Empire was, let's say, smaller or more fragmented. Um, so we're dealing with an empire that was like 95% centralized as far as its imperial coinage was concerned. And we're not dealing with provincial coinage, which is a very, very different topic. And recent estimates uh, put at about 3 billion sesterci the amount of money or coins that were minted during Adrian reign, which means um, something like a billion denarii, so a billion individual denarii, of which, yeah, we have few tens of thousands surviving 
but we're talking about very large numbers. And to put things in perspective, in 2002, when the euro was introduced um, in the European Union, or most of the European Union, Germany had to replace its entire stock of Deutschmark by euros, and they minted 17 billion coins. That's just 17 times what the Roman Empire was doing. So thinking about the difference in population and economic development and the mechanics of minting coins, the Romans minted by hand, not with um, machines. So it, it's a performance. The reign of Adrian, as stressed by Richard Abdi, um, is very specific in terms of artistic diversity. We have a traveling emperor. I think that's the only emperor that traveled almost everywhere in the empire, or very much almost everywhere. And there are some correlation, but Richard will, will, will talk about it, between what the coins represent and the, um, the traveling emperors, where, where, he's, where he's going. The older volume, so there was a volume for Adrian before, that was published in 1926. So this volume by Mattingly and Sydenham covers Vespasian to Adrian. The new volume by Abdi covers just Adrian. So it, it gives you a sense of what has been had added in a matter of a little bit less than a century. Um, there used to be 1,095 types. We're dealing now with 3,204 types. So we, we're not comparing apple and apple exactly because the cystophory are not in the current volume. They will be in RPC. Um, and the gold and silver have been disentangled. In the past, they would, they would show up together. And there were many sort of subtypes in the original edition, very difficult to read. The new book has the merit of clarity, the indexes, the, uh, the plates, uh, the concordance tables, it provides an extremely valuable and uh, essential tool for anyone who wishes to deal with second century Roman imperial coinage. I'd like to finish by, you know, putting things in, in perspective. Um, I'm thinking about the forthcoming uh, volume on Trajan um, by uh, our friend Bernard Wojtek. I'm, have in mind as well the many dye studies that have been published lately by Martin, Martin Beckman, another good friend of the ANS. And the combination of all these works will allow um, historian, the mismatist, economic historian, uh, to possess unparalleled um, tools at their disposal in order to study the Roman Empire numismatic and coinage system as, as its apex. Thank you, Richard. It's all yours now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, obviously, I'd like to begin by giving my wholehearted thanks to Professor Collier and Carol Ann uh, and the ANS for hosting this uh, amazing prize. Uh, I'll return to more thanks later at the end. But first, I thought I should give a little bit about the backgrounds to RIC, uh, the antecedents of it, and problems that it sort of faces on the way and how it links into 21st century technology like um, uh, the online version which is also hosted by the ANS. So if I want to start, I'm wondering how I do this, if I could have a bit of technical assistance. <laughs> um, ah, it's sort of behind isn't it? Ah, there it is. But I will get, I will, I will, I will share our screen first. Yeah. Great. Okay, right. Well, RIC 2.3, The Coinage of Hadrian, was published in the very last days of normal, if people remember that, back in October 2019. But um, the... It's a, it was a 10 year project, at least, because these sort of things usually are. And I can still vividly remember the day back in 2008 when the uh, lead editor of the RIC series, Andrew Burnett, took me out for a free lunch 
Of course, as we all know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And 10 years and quite a few less brain cells later, uh, our IC 2.3 came out. Not quite a century since the original edition, uh, or IC 2, we can call it, uh, written by Harold Mattingly Sr. came out back in 1926, but quite close to getting on there. Um, and just this is an image of the cover, the generic Colosseum cover and all the new RIC uh, editions. Actually, the most recent one was, I think, 2007, which is RIC 2.1, the, uh, the Flavians uh, that came out. Uh, and you get, a, you get to choose a coin for the front cover, and it's a particularly nice specimen, perfectly preserved in the, the mud of the River Tyne, near to Hadrian's Wall, so very appropriate, and it's a, a, a ship type which uh, evokes the, the, the most travelled emperor of the era. Um, so this sort of work doesn't come uh, by itself, it's, it's produced by, as Newton would have said, standing on the shoulders of giants, or standing on the shoulders of the shoulders of giants, um, and uh, Mattingly himself took as his basis the, uh, the work of Henri Cohen, mid uh, 19th century French scholar. Um, and he did a monumental series of uh, the Republican and the Imperial series, multi multi volume. Uh, it's alphabetical. It didn't pretend to be a scientific um, listing uh, by production order, but alphabetical is good. You can find your type if you want. Um, it didn't have uh, as a note of the, the commonness uh, or the rarity, but it did have auction prices. Obviously, auction prices go out of date quickly, but um, you can get a, a relative idea of what might be rare, very rare because it's very expensive, and what might be quite common because it's it's cheap. Uh, there was some howlers in it. For example, my favourite one was a description of a naked man with a rabbit. Turned out to be Neptune holding a, a small dolphin. Um, but, you know, if you're doing the whole gamut of Roman coinage, that's probably what you get. Um, it's just before the age of ph photography or photographic plates, really, uh, but you do get some lovely engravings. They're actually very sensitively done, lovely uh, uh, artwork. Uh, so RIC2 is then published in the, uh, the 20s, and by the 30s we have uh, quite a few works beginning to be published that proves that uh, uh, Mattingly got it rather wrong in some aspects of his production order. Uh, early 30s, the German scholar Paul Strack produced his amazing corpus. It's just absolutely stunning, really, really thorough. Um, and that prompted Mattingly to have a rethink by producing the collection catalogue for the BM, the BMC, which is uh, much better. I think the ANS, if I remember, orders its uh, Hadrian collection by BMC, uh, if I'm right in thinking that. Uh, but not, not many collections do that. The most still stick to RIC because that's, that was the most convenient typological way of doing it. Um, also, at the end of the 30s, Lefranchi, uh, working in Milan, produced the Milan catalogue, uh, which is a very thin volume, but very, very uh, well done. It's, it, it, it's a really good, um, he's clearly thought about it for many decades, uh, thought about the subject of Hadrian. But Strack remains quite obscure, sadly. It's an unwieldy book. It's a, a large uh, sort of gatefold um, catalog on paper that tends to decompose quite readily so it falls to bits as you try and open each page and it's never 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 a popular thing on the shelf on to the 21st century um and rc 2.3 feeds uh, onto its online version hosted by the ans I can't praise it enough online coins of the roman empire or ochre so there now stands about 2000 plus British Museum Hadrian coins on ochre, uh, all in RIC 2.3 order. Um, there's some other collections that have also fed into that, 
but there's, it's, it's a work in progress with the, the non-BM coins. We tried to transfer everything via a concordance from RIC2 to uh, RIC2.3, but it didn't really work because the, the difference is it's, that there's just, as Sheila was saying, there's just so much more division of types with, with the new work. So it was a, a shame, but we did our best. Um, and with that comparison, old RIC2 uh, was just a third of the book, as was being said. Uh, the uh, that volume had the Flavians, Nerva, Trajan, and Hadrian together. So uh, Hadrianic coin illustrations were about 150 odd, not very many. RIC 2.3 uh, has over 3,000 types, so it's tripled. It has 218 plates, so it's very comprehensive. It's over 3,000 specimens illustrated. Um, and of course, it's its own very large book. The plates of RIC 2.3 are black and white still, even in the 21st century. It's a matter of convenience because we have digital images, but we also use casts from specimens that aren't readily available. And we have old auction catalogues as well. So. Uh, they, these all feed in and it's easier to have them in, in black and white. But of course, if you want the colour specimens, especially the, the core collection, the BM, you go to ochre and you can see it on screen. Ochre is also a living catalogue. So uh, people do spot varieties because it flushes out new varieties having a published catalogue uh, or rare types that we just couldn't get images of. And if it has a stable online site, you can uh, notify the ANS and it can be linked in uh, as kind of variant on that, that page, the relevant page. So it's uh, all good. Another uh, development for RIC is it has a little uh, guest medallion section. I'm very grateful, grateful for, to Peter Mittag, who's done his own uh, corpus on the, the medallions of Hadrian uh, for uh, inserting that into the, into the book. There's 150 odd medallion types and 18 plates of these very often very beautiful um, uh, objects. They are intimately related to the, the coinage, typologically speaking. So, for example, we have this uh, uh, eight denarius uh, medallion, eight gold, uh, eight small normal silver pieces in this one big one. Uh, but it still follows the format of a denarius of Hadrian of AD 124 to 7. We have the legend Hadrianus Augustus on the obverse and on the reverse, cause 3. Uh, but we have a much more refined subject on the reverse, probably a copy of an Athenian painting. So um, uh, very nice to have them in. Uh, but uh, I'm mainly the coins person. So if we go back to the coins, starting with some problems. Uh, well, actually, the, the first couple of years of Hadrian aren't really a problem. They're nicely dated. He has, as part of his titulature, uh, his uh, consular account. He starts off as cause one or cause in his first year from the, uh, the summer of 117 to the end. You can see on the gold aureus, uh, uh, just as cause, that's cause one. And then second year, he takes the consulship again in uh, January of 118, and he's caused two in the coinage, easy peasy. He has uh, quite an unchanging portrait. He's the first bearded emperor, and you don't really see much change, really. Um, but there is a great variety of bust types, and Strack well knew to record every type permutation of, of bust. So, uh, for example, these two early types are good examples. We have a Carast bust, you can see the flexible Terrigay's ter shoulder straps there uh, and his breastplate. Uh, and on the right, we have a kind of nude heroic bust, a bit like the, the British Museum's marble bust uh, you see there. Um, and uh, yeah, so as these change and the combinations are incredibly important to uh, uh, record and to understand as part of the progression of types. The main problem comes with the third consulship, 
which is taken in uh, January of 119, and he doesn't bother with any more after that to the end of the reign in 138. So it's a big period where he just has calls three on the coinage. It's divided uh, almost in two by the adoption of the title PP for Patrick Patrie, father of his country. Uh, and we know from external inscriptional evidence that, that occurs in at least from the beginning of 128. So how to divide up this big uh, amorphous period? Well, uh, Strack was very good in the, the first period. He noted that it, that it ran from 119 to 123. It's a period when most of the legends are very similar to the Cos II legend, as you'd imagine. Um, I think it's possible, looking at the Sesterci, to break it down a little bit further. So on the top left, you have the, the typical Cos II going into early Cos III uh, legend. Um, uh, nice uh, brass Sestercius with a, a kind of nude bust. Imp, Kaiser, Trianus, Hadrianus, Og. Then the next phase, uh, what was on the reverse was the title PM for Pontifex Maximus, TRP for Tribunicia Potestas, not enumerated sadly, and then cause three. And that is taken from the reverse and put onto the obverse and very long cramped legend, leaving what we'd have a descriptive reverse uh, period, which is describing the personification, etc. that's on the, on the back. Then there's a second phase, uh, another phase, uh, where the Trianus is contracted to Trian, still with this long legend, and then a uh, final phase taking it up to one, two, three, where the PMTRP calls threes and move back to the reverse, and we have uh, the simpler legend, but still with the contracted Trian as part of the, the, the setup. Uh, after one, two, three, we have uh, one, two, four onwards, we have a much more simplified legend where it's just Hadrianus Augustus focusing on perhaps the first emperor, I think. Uh, and that is modified in one, two, eight with the addition of PP, so Hadrianus Augustus PP. And then PP goes to the reverse for a very short period. And we have from, uh, as Lefranchi well noted, uh, from 130 to the end, 138, uh, uh, a great output where you have a descriptive reverse legend and the obverse Hadrianus Og Cos 3 PP. You'll see a lot of that. Um, and it's also worth noting that each change of legend starts with a very simple uh, uh, array of bust options and then uh, as subsequent uh, uh, issues mount up, they, they become much more um, complex and varied. So, against that background of changing uh, legend types, we can look at some nice landmark uh, types of Hadrian and see how they slot in. So, uh, a good example is the liberalitas type, where Hadrian or any emperor of Atta that uses this sort of type would be shown giving a handout to the citizens. And these uh, donative events are enumerated on Hadrian's coinage. They go up to Liberalitas 7. Interestingly, Hadrian's first emperor to use uh, the, the, the term liberalitas. Previous emperors used congiarium or distribution. In fact, in Hadrian's speeches that are recorded, he, he uses the term congiarium as a, you know, except a handout. Uh, so, for example, on the left we have uh, Liberalitas 3, and it's that long legend of Trianus still there. Liberalitas 4, we have Hadrianus Augustus, so we're in that uh, period post 124. Uh, and then uh, the final handout, uh, 7, has that Hadrianus Og Cos 3 PP obverse that looks so familiar. Another form of evidence is die linking and uh, Professor Martin Beckman's magnificent work uh, at McMaster University has already been mentioned. I'm incredibly indebted that he was uh, willing to share uh, a lot of his research that's sort of fed into, uh, into the, the book. Um, the late part of Hadrian's reign has more correlation between the Aurian denarii and the bronze coinage, uh, but you really have to look at the, the gold and silver on its own merits in the earlier part of the reign. 
Uh, so dial linking is, of course, incredibly handy when you can get it. There's also uh, a dial link study for the Sesterci uh, in the Garonne treasure, the, one of the largest Sesterci hoards known, uh, found in France, and the Garonne team have done a magnificent job in uh, making dial links where they can see them. So, for example, in this particular case, uh, we, we can dial link at the top left uh, a coin that notes the Vicenalia or the 20th anniversary vows upheld vota su scepta, it says, for the 20th anniversary that we know from external evidence occurred in December of 137. Uh, and you can link it all the way through to types which have well, rather strange uh, busts that look like uh, not Hadrian, but uh, Hadrian's uh, adoptive heir Aelius. Very odd what's going on. This is first noticed by Lefranchi. Um, uh, now, Aelius's coinage was being struck in 137. Um, the only theory I can come up with is that they might have used a proprietary uh, punch, what we call a hub, to make the, the bust shape initially. And the, uh, the engraver has used the wrong shape of punch but still stretched Hadrian's features over over the, uh, the bust and still has Hadrian's uh, legends as well. So that's good evidence of coinage of 137, for example, and you also get that with uh, Hadrian's ultimate successor Antoninus uh, in the following year. I particularly like the coinage of Hadrian's empress, Sabina. Now, Hadrian is the first emperor to give a regular coinage to the empress. Uh, it's very noticeable. It, it begins from the second half of the reign onwards um, and right up to the time of her death and deification, consecratio, as you see there. Um, and it's a good case in point with the, uh, the ancient sources for the reign of Hadrian, which are quite vague and uh, rather annoying, actually, because uh, it mentions the, the Augustan history, for example, is probably the, the, the most fulsome. It does mention the death of Sabina, both before the death of Aelius on New Year's Day of 137, and after the death of Aelius. So it can't be both. What is it? We know from uh, provincial coinage, dated coinage of a missus in Asia Minor, that her lifetime coinage certainly goes up to the year 137, 138. So it seems to be quite close to the end. But I think the best evidence comes from the capital line, where there's a relief of the deification of Sabina, um, quite similar to the coin type, although she's on a, a winged uh, female figure rather than on an eagle. But you can see Hadrian's observing it. Some unkind people say she's, he's giving her the finger. Uh, but uh, uh, behind him is, very importantly, his colleague, um, the, the Caesar Junior Emperor, and it's Antoninus. Now Antoninus only uh, exceeds in February of 138, so this deification could only be occurring between February and uh, June of 138. Adrian eventually dies. So, I keep mentioning external evidence, and I really want to pay tribute to the work of the Kaiser Tabella team, uh, initially read, uh, led by uh, Professor Kienast and then naturally by Professor Werner Eck, who's been terribly helpful in giving me advice. Um, and a lot of external, a really good source of external evidence is the bronze discharge diplomas that were handed out to auxiliary soldiers conferring citizenship they're great because they have a, a, a lot of the titles that don't appear on Hadrian's coinage, particularly the enumeration of the, uh, the Tribunician count. So Trib Hot 6, as you can see in this excerpt at the bottom, that takes you to the year 122, the year that Hadrian visited Britain very briefly on his great voyage. Um, and it also carries information like uh, it's specific to when Hadrian's out of Italy, he's a proconsul, so pro cause appears. And is that that sort of evidence that has allowed uh, the Kaiser Tabella team to really pinpoint 
the, um, the times Hadrian was actually traveling outside Italy. And that's something that Mattingly and Strack didn't actually know. So uh, it, it's certainly the right time to be studying the coinage of Hadrian. Three or four grand expeditions, you could say. His first expedition back from the east uh, to, to pick up his role as emperor in Rome uh, in the middle of 118. And then the grand expedition from 121 up to Britain, down to Spain, and across to the eastern frontier, and then back through uh, uh, Greek lands. Um, another landmark type is the most dated coin in the whole Roman imperial period, which occurs uh, in a reign that's not really very good for dating. Um, uh, but it's to celebrate, we talked about his Vicenalia, his 20th anniversary. This is for his Quinquinalia, his fifth anniversary, held in 121. We have a, a type that shows, that alludes to the chariot games that would have occurred. Uh, we have the genius, the spirit of the, the, uh, the hippodrome, carrying a chariot wheel and clutching the spina uh, decorated with obelisks of the Circus Maximus, you can see on this uh, terracotta tile. It also has uh, Nat Urb, Natalus Urbis. It's the birthday of Rome. So it's uh, April the 21st, to be precise. And uh, Miracle of Miracles, it actually has the year in the era of Rome, uh, Ad Urbs Condita. So we have the year 874 of Rome, and that takes us to 121. So 21st of April, 121. Wonderfully datable. Um, uh, we think that this Quinquinalia was brought forward in the year so that Hadrian could depart on his great expedition in the summer of 121, because you have to travel between the equinoxes in the ancient world um, for practical reasons. So uh, it's also very gratifying to see, unusually in this period, that the type is also on the this bronze Cisterci and the medallions. Um, Cisterci's particularly, Circeus type is particularly interesting. It's a rather poor example, I'm afraid, but it still has the uh, longer legend Trianus on it at this particular point. So we know that uh, uh, the Trianus type legend goes up to at least the spring of 121. A donative is given to this die link with the, the, the liberalitas of three types. Um, and they're in turn related to more generic moneta type, which just expresses Hadrian's generosity generally. Um, and that moneta cistercius type spans the phase change between Trianus and Trian. So we can tell it's close, but uh, quite subsequent to spring of 121. And then Hadrian departs, and we have types that uh, uh, give the nod to this. There's ship types when he's on his travels, and we have uh, the type of Fortuna Reduci, uh, Fortuna Redux, for Fortune the Homebringer, uh, sort of come back soon types. And it's a uh, also, uh, a useful cross-check, because we have a half Cistercius type there that is very closely related to the Cistercius coinage, a Dipondius, um, with the Trian contraction, um, uh, but also a subtle change in bust type. So you get armoured bust types, which are now more closely cropped, and the Terrigi's shoulder straps are now gone. And the higher denominations, the, the, the gold and silver, uh, don't carry through on those legend changes, but they do evolve the bust types. So the silver denarius type you see in the bottom has that same shorn cuirass. So it gives you the, the period that the, the, that coinage relates to. Um, you can play the same game with the lower denominations below the Cistercius, including the, the, the as which do have the Trian, uh, Trianus Trian uh, phase change. Um, so with this type, the famous Britannia type, uh, which I think is 
quite relevant to a, a US audience as well, because there must have been uh, pennies of George III circulating in, in America with, with uh, Britannia on. Will this meet the, the, the very first type a couple of millenniums previously? Um, uh, the first occurrence, we have the Trianus. So it must date, as Strack actually noted, uh, to 119, 120, before Hadrian actually sets off on his, uh, his expedition to Britain. Um, interestingly, it's not the very first depiction that we know of in Roman art of Britannia. Uh, there's a mid first century uh, uh, relief in Aphrodisias in Asia Minor, showing Claudius subduing the, the Amazonian Britannia, quite inappropriate for uh, uh, the British climate. The Hadrianic coin, though, is much more uh, geared up for rough weather. She has uh, uh, trousers and a hooded cloak as well. It's, it's quite hard to see this, this hood which is going up, but on really good specimens, you can see the line of the hood that's being drawn up. And it's a bit like you see on representations of, of uh, British peasantry, a plowman group from near Hadrian's Wall. Uh, it's hood goes up and uh, you're protected from the elements. Um, also, a lot of people have speculated in the past as to whether what Britannia has got a foot on, a bunch of rocks, is that Hadrian's Wall? Well, um, we don't think so nowadays because uh, there seems to be a consensus with scholarship that uh, Hadrian's Wall began uh, probably with the visit of Hadrian in 122. So a coin of 119, 120 doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't convey that. Uh, oh, and just to show Britain's a good place for a hoodie, probably <laughs> whether we're getting outside at the moment. Um, uh, to understand where the Britannia type is coming from as a design, we need to look at another lovely output of Hadrian's coinage in the later part of his reign, the descriptive series that begins in 130, uh, that we call the province cycle. And these are uh, commemorate uh, virtually every corner that Hadrian has passed through up until that point. He's got to Egypt by 130. Um, and so he's so gone through the whole of the empire. Uh, now, they follow, the, the province types themselves follow a kind of convention, if you like, peaceful, prosperous interior provinces usually are shown as re relaxed, reclining figures um, holding uh, attributes of prosperity, fruits and that sort of thing, and corn. Uh, whereas, uh, and that's what you see with Hispania waving an olive branch uh, or Egyptos reclining opposite an ibis, I think. Um, <laughs> In contrast, frontier provinces are always shown active and alert, armed and armoured. So on the top uh, right, you have a denarius of Germania uh, on guard against the uh, barbarians, no doubt. For the wildest and most distant lands of the empire, we seem to add a, a rocky environment to convey it's your, your, the ends of the earth. So we have Dacia that sits in a pile of rocks as well, presumably the Carpathians, when you compare that with Cappadocia in the far easternmost part of the empire, where she's holding a bunch of rocks which are in the shape, very distinctive shape of Cappadocia's holy mountain, Mount Argeus. So in this context, Britannia just seems to be uh, shown as a sort of wild, rocky place, because we have a reprise of that early Britannia as uh, in amongst the series of the provinces. Now, uh, the province series seems to kick off from the visit to Egypt, which is, is recorded in the coinage, and that occurs, uh, begins in 130, middle of 130. There's even a nice uh, medallion, which, I, which is included uh, of, with a descriptive series, which commemorates the lion hunt, the famous Libyan lion hunt that Hadrian uh, uh, undertook with his lover Antonus, um, and you see that in the medallions, the lion chase, but not, not in the coinage. Um, so that 
another there's another good reason to, sh to see that it begins in, in 1.30. Um, also, it's worth noting that you get in the medals a lot of uh, uh, hybrids. So um, low volume coinage seems to uh, entail a lot of reuse of older dye. So this is an older pairing with Hadrianus Augustus PP type, which actually should be partnered with a non-descriptive reverse, but in this case, it's got a, a, a new or hybrid pairing. You do get Virtuti Augusti medallions with the proper Hadrianus Aug Cos 3 uh, PP type as well. Uh, and the, the end of the, the uh, cycle of provinces seems to occur um, well, by 133. We know Hadrian uh, had returned home to uh, Rome definitively uh, in the sailing season of 133. Um, uh, and just prior to that, he'd been uh, probably involved directly in the Jewish, the combating the Jewish revolt, which began in, in the autumn of 132. Uh, and you begin to see a lot of military references come in at that point. Um, but he seemed to very quickly replace himself with the governor of Britain, who's, uh, Julius Severus, that's who's shipped all the way over from the other end of the empire. Uh, and under Severus's governorship, Judea uh, is, is condemned becomes Syria Palestina on documents that you see at the bottom there. Uh, and therefore, coinage like Adventui Og Judea should predate this condemnation. Um, I mentioned the Hadrian as this big game hunter, the imperial big game hunter of his age. He hunted the Libyan lion in 130. But he had an earlier period uh, of good hunting in 124 in Asia Minor, so good that he named a city, uh, founded a city on the site with the name of Hadrianothery, Hadrian's Happy Hunting Grounds. Um, and that occurred just prior to a visit that autumn of 124 to Eleusis, the shrine of. Uh, the cult of Demeter and Ceres, just outside Athens. So, uh, and this is a, a, a reused Hadrianic tondo in the Arch of Constantine, showing Hadrian with the boar, possibly Antonus in the background. Antonus, I have to say, doesn't feature in the Roman imperial coinage at all, um, so I can't really show you much of him. Um, but uh, there's an amazing coin type where we have an outpouring of uh, Diana types, which is common enough, uh, and presumably dates to 124. Um, but Kinast first noted this in 1960. There is one unique Cistercius in uh, Munich where his laurel wreath is replaced by a corn wreath, a corn wreath of, of uh, uh, Ceres, perhaps. So these two episodes combine very nicely for the later part of 124. And we can see that it's the Hadrianus Augustus of verse type, um, but it's not the earliest bust in this in that sequence. We know uh, it's long been known that the, the earliest bust type looks quite similar to some of the chest busts that you see in the previous group. And you see a, a little bit of chest there, and that's on a coin type of uh, an as type which features. Uh, uh, Janus, so it could well be uh, the first part of the year, you'd imagine you'd produce a Janus type in January 124, perhaps. Also with an early bust type is this little half denarius piece with the emblem of Augustus, his personal insignia of the Capricorn. So what's going on? Why this Augustus um, uh, 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 allusion going on? Well, um, Strack suggested that perhaps it was because it was the 150th anniversary of uh, Octavian becoming Augustus, which seems a sort of slightly odd anniversary. To my mind, I think it seems more likely that it's the, uh, the seculum, the, the sacred 110 year century that the Romans paid great heed to, 
uh, since the death and deification of Augustus. So, 1480 uh, to uh, 124. And this works well to my mind because so much of Hadrian's coin messaging is devoted to golden age illusions. Um, it didn't have much in the way of victories to celebrate, so instead we have a lot of very sophisticated messaging. Um, uh, so, for example, in the first, the, the Quinquinalia uh, series, uh, we have a uh, an actual personification of the golden age, golden age, Siculum Aureum, shown as a young man clutching a zodiac wheel and holding the, uh, the, the immortal phoenix. Uh, another lovely golden age type occurs slightly later. It's Hadrian's Augustus, just prior to the point that the PP kicks in. Uh, so it could well be around the time of the spring 127, which would be eight uh, seculum since the foundation of Rome and the stars are coming back into uh, their alignment as the Romans believed. It's uh, a type that probably represents the septum triones, uh, what uh, in Britain we call a plough or in the States the Big Dipper. Um, and it's quite fascinating because that moves, uh, uh, progresses, and this is a type progression, production flow, if you like, that's so important to pay heed to. Um, uh, it seems to go from seven stars and a crescent moon to one star and a crescent moon. And this type also features an alternating globe mark in the exerg, the bit underneath the design. Um, in turn, there's uh, five uh, reverse types that feature this alternating globe mark, presumably contemporary ones off five different production lines in the mint, perhaps, and they move into uh, the, the next phase where PP appears, so Hadrianus Augustus PP, so we've moved into 128. And you can play that game all the way down the line. I'm not going to show you every, every time that happens, because that would we'd be here all night. But it is interesting to note, for example, that the start, the very first coinage of Sabina occurs with this transition to PP. So uh, Sabina Augusta on the uh, left hand side of the, uh, the obverse there. And then uh, she has a bit uh, referencing her relationship to the emperor Hadriani, sort of, of Hadrian, the emperor Og. Uh, but some of this uh, series then has old PP. So again, going into 127. Nicely dates the start. Uh, talking about production flow, hordes themselves can help uh, confirm that the sequence of coinage, incredibly useful to uh, study when you can get them. There's not a huge number of coins that uh, of, of hordes that end uh, with the reign of, of Hadrian or just beyond. But there's a couple of really big ones from Austria, the Renweg horde from uh, just next to Vienna and the Erla, which is uh, further uh, up the Danube. Um, there are around about a thousand coins each, uh, mainly denarii, some auri, uh, and they both run all the way up to the descriptive series, so they go into 130, uh, but Erla is a little bit later, and you see it go into the provinces series as well, so that's very gratifying to see. Also, it gives you an impression of how the coins of Sabina develops. We've seen that uh, an epigraphic type is the uh, is the type that begins around about 128. And then she also seems to get a descriptive series around about the same time. So we, we have uh, uh, types that have description, in this case, Concordia, Og, as you can see in the middle. The other great thing about hordes is that they confirm uh, period proportions. So, um, for example, there's an awful lot of types in the provinces cycle, and it takes up a huge part chunk of the catalogue, uh, but can it really be so short as to be a couple of years, 131, 132, 133? Well, uh, 
you can confirm that by looking at the uh, proportions of the, the periods, as I now have them, on hordes. Um, and yeah, it does seem to be the case. So for gold, we can look at the fantastic uh, Trier hoard, which is two and a half thousand auri to the end of the second century. Uh, I've already mentioned the uh, great Cistercius hoard from the Garonne River, um, probably a shipment that was destined for Britain, perhaps. Um, that extends into the Antonine period. And the biggest of them all is the Recadevnia hoard from Bulgaria, uh, which is over 80,000 denarii going into the third century. And I'm very grateful to Bill Metcalf, who uh, furnished me with his frequency tables for Recadevnia, which helped so much with uh, judging the, 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 the commonness and the rarity of the different types. Uh, interesting, interestingly, you can use hoard evidence for um, uh, commonness, but Strack was very good at uh, giving you a collection count, so it saved me a lot of time using Strack for uh, rarity. Now, uh, the great advice I was given by the authors of RIC 2.1, uh, just when I, when I started out, was uh, to look at production, uh, uh, proportions and hordes, uh, but also, above all, to just go by how the product, you feel the production should flow, go with the flow, if you like, which is hard to describe, but you kind of pick it up as you, uh, uh, as you study the coinage. Um, and that was sage advice that really helped me get to grips with the amorphous beast that is cause three. And so I leave you with the portion, the, the, the period groupings as I have them there. And uh, final thoughts with Hadrian is, it's a real privilege to have been able to produce the catalog for the coinage of Hadrian, because it stands at the end of a very great period of, of good, if you like to use this value, value judgments, fine numismatic art that really begins under the, the period of Nero uh, in uh, AD 64, when the mint of Rome reopens, and you have uh, very high relief busts, very sculptural busts, very sensitively um, detailed, and you also have a good variety and very inventive a variety of verse types. So, for example, my favourite one I think of all is this type which shows uh, Hadrian returning to Rome in 125 after his great expedition, uh, a whole forum scene in front of the masses as he orates from the rostrum. Uh, so, it just leaves me to say, reiterate my huge thanks to Professor Collier and to Caroline as well, uh, and to the ANS for this prize. But also, it's a big project producing RIC. So I have to thank uh, the editors. It was a, a team of editors, not just uh, Andrew there, but also uh, Michel Armandry is very supportive as well, Roger Bland and Chris Houdjigo. Uh, the publishers, Spink, of course, um, uh, the head of publication was Emma Howard, and the publication's assistant, Rachel Wilkinson, was a huge, huge help in uh, producing all the uh, paraphernalia, all the ind indices and that sort of thing. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of sponsorship that goes into producing a work like this uh, from the San Francisco, San Francisco uh, Coin Club. We have Wayne Kimber, and Rick Bellison, I want to pay tribute to their incredible generosity, Graham Barker in England, and also some institutional sponsors as well, CNG, uh, Spink had their own publication fund, and BM itself had a, a research fund as well. And uh, also a huge number of institutions, I won't read them all out, but it began back in 2009 in the ANS, uh, where I was very generously hosted and was able to look through the entire collection at my leisure in, in wonderful city of New York. And it's incredibly appropriate 
that uh, I should be back here again to accept this prize. So thank you so much. It was it was a very good lunch. <laughs> mm. Yes, but um, uh, I think it's very. Uh, would have I would I have embarked on it if I'd known it would take so long and so much brain power? I don't know. I don't. I don't want to think. I don't want to think about that. Um, it's probably better to just uh, be grateful that it did happen and I finished it. Uh, finishing, of course, is a very difficult thing to do, and Andrew was, uh, he was very strict. I, I wanted a couple more years just to refine it, and I, I think the, the problem with these catalogues is you can, you can never get to 100%, never get to 100%, so you might be 95% right, but then if you work for more and more years, you might get to 96, 97% right, then more and more and more, but... Uh, uh, Andrew knew that my mental health dictated that I should finish <laughs> and get rid of it, which I did. I'm duly grateful. <laughs> well, thank you, Richard. It's very kind of you to make those remarks, quite unnecessary. Um, and I think in your lecture, you would, uh, in your usual um, modest way, you uh, underestimated your own contribution comparison of those to your uh, predecessors, but I think the lecture did illustrate the wide range of skills that you used back in the historical that you needed to bring this project to a um, successful conclusion. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, uh, as well as just the point side of it, it really makes all sorts of other set of other sorts of interesting trains of thought. I mean, talk a bit about um, Adrian's vocation of the arts. Saw a number of occasions where his love of art and so on was kind of changed. I, I, I wanted to ask that in a one particular sort of angle. I don't know if you thought about this. Is, is in, a, in a world where we're constantly told by numismatists that all coinage is produced in some relation to warfare. I mean, one nice thing, particularly by our chairman this evening, um, one of the course, the characteristics of Hadrian's reign is that. There weren't any wars, except mm. for really the wars, yes. Have you thought about, you know, what, what, what's behind, how, how would you explain historically, maybe it's going to be a question of just renewing the stock of chronic circulation, or, or, or no, could you repeat the question? Could you, could you oh, oh, right, yes. So, um, you want to know what's behind Hadrian's, uh, uh, thinking as uh, someone that didn't have a uh, much in the way of warfare to publicize. Um, I think he was a very clever uh, politician, very canny politician. Uh, for example, his first journey, if you like, is back from the, the eastern uh, part of the empire, and he seems to have gone along probably the Danube frontier, the most important frontier uh, in the empire and you know, shown himself to the troops, ingratiated himself to the troops. There's a wonderful inscription from Lambysis in North Africa, where it shows him working the army, working the crowds um, uh, with, with great aplomb. He has uh, big speeches and he shows his appreciation and also He's quite critical of the displays that are put in front of him, so he knows he, he's someone with a lot of military experience, so he doesn't necessarily have a lot to prove on the battlefield, but he certainly, in terms of technicalities, seems to uh, uh, be keen to demonstrate that he, he's, he's one, of the, one of the troops, if you like. Um, but also, uh, in the Lambaisis inscription, at the end of each regiment that he meets, he says, 
accept a handout, accept a congiorium, so he knows how to buy popularity, uh, along with things like the distribution to the citizens, seven uh, major distributions. So uh, he's a great uh, political manoeuvrer, I think, and also the idea of presenting the reign as uh, as a golden age must presumably be an extension of that. Be, he's probably also someone who's very educated uh, and must have surrounded himself with a lot of people that uh, liked making sophisticated illusions as well. So people that might be in charge of the mint think themselves rather clever to be able to um, allude to uh, a bit of Vir Virgil, a bit of the Aeneid, that kind of thing. And the golden age is returned. Oh no, he didn't start the the tradition of distribution events. Uh, that that actually occurs. The best uh, uh, documented uh, cases of the first emperor Augustus, because we have his uh, autobiography, if you like, in the form of the Res Geste, uh, where he. Uh, details each uh, conchiarium, as he would call it. Um, and I think there's, there's at least six, is there? I'm sure I remember better, but they're not only the detail, but he actually says how many, per, how much per citizen as well. So you have a really good idea. And we know what they're for. So they might be for victories, handed out for victories, or an accession, accession of an heir, the coming of age of an heir as well. Um, so there's a, a variety of causes that it can be given for. So with Hadrian, of course, we don't really know um, the reason, but we can kind of guess the way that he, if he meets and greets people in the army, for example, and then has a handout, uh, presumably it's the same uh, kind of idea of he, he arrives back in Rome, meets and greets the people, and at the end, accept a handout. Any other questions? Sure. Oh. Regarding Denari and Auri, are you seeing many dyes used for both? Yes. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a good period because it's the uh, uh, first half of Hadrian's reign, the dye span of Auri and Denari uh, are the same. But uh, after 128, after that PP appears, the dye span for denarii shrinks uh, and they become sort of dumpier flans. Uh, but up until that point, you do get rare examples of uh, the occasional aureus dye being used on a denarius and presumably vice versa as well. And it's something you also see in the Flavian period as well. That's, that's noted by my colleagues who did the, the, the Flavian uh, part of RIC2. So it's, it's interesting to see that you can get that but sake, and of course, it's the same thing with uh, Dupondi and Azas. You sometimes get that accidental hybridization. But it doesn't occur on the second half of the reign because you've got different sized dyes. I'm sure this is discussed somewhere. I was just think, sitting here thinking you see some Judean revolt reflected, you know, so much in the coinage of Vespasian uh, and Titus. I'm trying to think, is the victory uh, over Bar reflected at all in the imperial coinage? It's, it's very subtle. It's very subtle. There's this, the uh, other emperors you'd expect, because uh, uh, he took a second imperatorial acclamation. So he had the right, uh, certainly on uh, exter uh, external evidence, uh, other inscriptions, non coin inscriptions, you do see Imp 2 appear. And there's a, I think there's a reconstruction of an arch from uh, Judea which has uh, a tripod date of 20 and imp2 together, uh, would that we got that on the coinage, but no, there's, 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 there's an... Is this an embarrassment as opposed to a... I don't know if it's an embarrassment. I just think I mean, uh, he's, uh, his messaging is quite subtle. What you do see in the coinage of 136 
uh, is an uh, uh, ominous type of nemesis. And she shows a kind of victory and uh, she's spitting on her breast, pulling out the drapery and spitting on her breast for, for good luck. So that, that seems to be a sort of comment, nemesis fate. And you see the wheel of fortune sometimes held as well. So it's kind of a subtle reference, but not, not very overt. But it is, it is admittedly very unusual compared to previous reigns. And it's also interesting that the coronage of Hadrian uses the uh, references provinces, uh, not as kind of the backdrop for military victories as you'd expect with Judea Capita in, in the Flavian period, but it's kind of, uh, it's showing the extent of my mighty empire. There's just so much of it, a different kind of attitude, ocumeni. Out of character. Yes, it's an embarrassment. You know, the, the, the name of Judea is erased. It becomes Syria Palestina in reference beyond that point. Well, I'd again like to congratulate the Richards. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.